Hi, I'm Anna Rizzo and I'm back with another lecture. Finally, as I promised, this lecture is, uh, <clears throat> is on the hippocampal marker circuits. And this lecture is, is, uh, is the last lecture, okay? Uh, particularly, it's the last lecture of those lectures on explicit memory storage. Uh, actually, section three of those lectures. Anyway, so uh, forget about this. Uh, forget that. <clears throat> This is the outline for this lecture, the hippocampal marker circuits. First, uh, before talking about the hippocampal marker circuits, I want to uh, review the mesoscale synaptic circuitry. I talked about it, uh, about the mesoscale synaptic circuitry of the hippocampal formation in previous lectures, but I just want to review that before uh, uh, explaining the hippocampal marker circuits. And uh, after that, I'm going to introduce some s common cell types uh, that have been identified in CA3 and CA1 marker circuits. Then I'm going to talk about the synaptic transmission in CA1 and CA3. And I'm going to, after that, I'm going to introduce uh, some, uh, I'm going to talk about some uh, properties of interneurons, particularly interneurons in CA1 marker circuits. And finally, I'm going to talk about the interactions between pyramidal cells and interneurons and how they collaborate with, with each other to produce uh, <coughs> some network oscillations in hippocampal marker circuits, okay? Fine. Uh, so, uh, before starting this uh, lecture, I should mention this fact that, you know, <coughs> this lecture is just a very basic introductory lecture on, or introduction to hippocampal marker circuits. Well, there is a book published by Springer Publication uh, with the same title, Hippocampal Marker Shakets. And that book has over 800 pages. And even those 800 pages are just the summaries of the research projects done by hundreds of uh, scientists, okay, on hippocampal marker circuits. So this is just a very uh, brief introduction to hippocampal marker circuits. And in this lecture, I'm going to focus primarily uh, or mostly on uh, CA1 and CA3 marker circuits, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. Okay, before talking about the hippocampal marker circuits, I want to review the mesoskill synaptic circuitry. And by mesoskill, I mean, uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about is not marker circuits, it's not uh, circuits or connectivity at the macro scale, it's at the intermediate level or mesoskill, okay? And this figure uh, shows uh, the cortical relationships in the hippocampal formation. I talked about hippocampal formation in previous lectures. I told you that the hippocampal formation is part of the limbic system in the brain, and it has the hippocampus plus some associated areas to the uh, uh, with the hippocampus. For instance, the uh, dentate gyrus, the uh, uh, <coughs> enterana cortex, the subicular cortex, and other areas. So uh, one important uh, note here is that the CA3 pyramidal cells are at the heart of the hippocampal formation. Of course, because of their extensive axonal collateral system, okay? Anyway, let's talk about the input and output of structures, re review them, and then I'm going to go and talk about the hippocampal marker circuits. Well, we have enterona cortex. Here it's divided into a lateral and medial enterona cortices. Uh, we all know that uh, the stellate cells, or ex uh, excitatory cells, at layer two of the enterona cortex, they contact the, uh, the granule cells in the dentate gyrus. And then the, these granule cells of the dentate gyrus, they contact the pyramidal cells in CA3 marker circuits and throw the mossy fiber pathway. And finally, we have the Schaefer collateral pathway where the pyramidal cells in CA3, they contact the pyramidal cells in CA1, okay? And this uh, pathway from layer two of the enterona cortex to the dentate gyrus, the dentate gyrus to the CA3, the mossy fiber pathway, and then the Schaefer collateral pathway. This pathway is called the indirect trisynaptic pathway. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, that's it. I just, wanted, I just uh, wanted to tell you something more about it, but I decided not to. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, glutamatergic or excitatory cells at layer three of the enterona cortex that directly contact the pyramidal cells in CA1. That's why this pathway is called direct perform pathway, okay? And then uh, <coughs> pyramidal cells uh, of CA1, they provide the major output of the hippocampus, and most of their, most of their output uh, goes back to the enterona cortex. Uh, some of it goes to subcortical areas, and some of it also goes to uh, the neocortex. Okay, so that was just a very brief, inter uh, very brief review 
of the mesoskeletal circuitry of the hippocampal formation. Now, let's talk about uh, the common cell types identified in CA3 and CA1 uh, marker circuits. Well, as I mentioned in previous lectures, identifying the individual cell types and, and of course their uh, morphological and electrophysiological properties is one of the very first steps in doing any microcircuit study. Okay, and uh, well, here you can see uh, a simplified model proposed for the microcircuits in CA3. And scientists have identified some common cell types. And here I'm just going to introduce some of those cell types that have been identified in CA3. And of course, also in CA1 microcircuits. <clears throat> well, first of all, um, again, in previous lectures, I told you that uh, in any microcircuit, we have two general populations of neurons. We have principal neurons that most of them are uh, uh, excitatory and we have interneurons that most of them are, uh, pr that are primarily inhibitory. So here we have these uh, in CA3 microcircuits we have these triangular red triangular cells. <clears throat> these are our uh, principal neurons. These are basically pyramidal cells and you can see that their cell, belly, their, their, uh, cell bodies are all, are all uh, sitting in the straight and pyramidal layer. That's why this layer uh, is called the straight and pyramidal because it contains the uh, cell bodies of all of these pyramidal neurons, okay? And then we have these uh, blue neurons. These blue neurons are inhibitory interneurons, okay? And uh, <coughs> surprisingly, scientists have so far identified 21 subtypes of in, uh, in, uh, inhibitory interneurons in CA3 and CA1 marker circuits. That tremendous diversity. 21 subtypes of interneurons. And here I'm just going to talk, uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, uh, a few of them, okay? We have, for instance, these ba uh, bistratified cells. We have these basket cells. Well, these basket cells, the reason they're called basket cells is because of their morphology. They have very branched axonal arborizations, and their axonal arborizations form uh, a structure like a basket around the soma of the postsynaptic targets, okay? And then we have these axaxonic cells, and uh, these axaxonic cells, uh, that's the, the reason they're called axaxonic is, is because they provide inhibition to the axon initial segment of the pyramidal cells. They have another name, and that is chandelier cells. Okay, they're also called chandelier cells because their axonal branches resemble the branches of a chandelier, okay? Then we have these orient lacrinosum molecular array cells. Uh, uh, something interesting about these cells is that, first of all, they're somatostatin, and somatostatin is a, is a peptide hormone um, used as a molecular marker for these, uh, for these uh, <coughs> types of interneurons, orient lacrinosum molecular array cells. And uh, something interesting about these cells is that uh, their cell bodies are at the stratum orients, but they send their axons to the lacrinosum, stratum lacrinosum molecular layer, okay? That's why they're called OLM or Orient's lacrinosum molecular cells. Their cousins in neocortical marker circuits are Martinotis cells because uh, Martinotis cells in neocortical microcircuits, they also sit in deep layers and then, then they, they're, uh, you know, they uh, send their axons to uh, top layers, to, to layer one, for instance, of the neocortical, uh, of the neocortex, sorry. And then we have these trilaminar cells. Well, the reason they're called trilaminar cells is because they provide inhibition at, layer, at layers of stratum orients, stratum pyramidal, and stratum radiatum. That's why they're called trilaminar cells. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about the microcircuits. So I'm going to talk about the synaptic transmission in CA1 and CA3 microcircuits. And you know what? One method, um, <clears throat> one method to analyze uh, any microcircuit as it is introduced and it is proposed in this book, Handbook of Brain Microcircuits by Professor Gordon Shepard, a fantastic book on microcircuits. And as it is proposed um, in other papers on microcircuits, one way to analyze a microcircuit is to identify, first is to identify and distinguish different types of synaptic transmission in a single microcircuit, or different types of synaptic contacts that the main cells make with each other or form with each other in a single microcircuit, okay? And according to that method, if you want to analyze uh, the marker circuits in CA3 and CA, uh, CA3 and CA1 area, uh, we have three types of synaptic transmission, okay, in CA3 and CA1 marker circuits. And those are excitatory to excitatory connections, 
Obviously, there are only between uh, excitatory cells. We have excitatory to inhibitory connections, of course, connections between excitatory, excitatory cells and our interneurons, which are inhibitory cells. And then connections between only in interneurons or inhibitory to inhibitory connections, okay? So this is again a simplified model uh, proposed for the CA3 and CA1 marker circuits. And I'm going to focus on this middle part and I go back for these uh, electrophysiological recordings at these uh, different synapses, okay? Okay. So now let, uh, let me talk about excitatory to excitatory connections, first in CA3 and then in CA1 microcircuits. Well, about, uh, you know, excitatory to excitatory connections, they can be extrinsic or intrinsic when we are talking about excitatory to excitatory connections in CA3 area. About extrinsic excitatory to excitatory connections in CA3, I should say that these pyramidal cells in CA3 microcircuits, they receive parasomatic excitation. It means that they receive feedforward excitatory signals at their um, cell bodies and near their cell bodies by those granule cells of the dentigyrus through the massive fiber pathway. Okay, so that is all about the extrinsic excitatory to excitatory connections in CA3 microcircuits. But these pyramidal cells, they also receive some recurrent excitation from local pyramidal cells. Consider this uh, <coughs> pyramidal cell, for instance. This pyramidal cell uh, sends one of its axon collaterals to this one and provides an uh, excitatory input to this pyramidal cell, to this pyramidal cell. There, we can call this recurrent or feedback uh, excitatory connection, okay? And this uh, recurrent excitatory connection is an example of intrinsic excitatory to excitatory connections. Now let's talk about excitatory to excitatory connections in CA1 area. Well, there is a highly divergent excitatory to excitatory connection from pyramidal cells in CA3 onto the pyramidal cells in CA1. <sighs> you know, when I say highly divergent, well, this is because uh, one pyramidal cell in CA3 can contact 30,000 to 60,000 other neurons. And most of their postsynaptic neurons or targets are in CA1, okay? And that is highly divergent, of course. And this highly divergent excitatory to excitatory connection in the Schaefer collateral pathway from CA3 pyramidal cells onto CA1 pyramidal cells favors the rapid synchronization of CA CA1 pyramidal cells. And these rapid synchronizations, as, I, as I'm going to this rapid synchronization of pyramidal cells in CA1 microcircuits, I'm going to explain about them, I'm going to talk about them and explain them uh, at the end of this lecture. They are important for, some, for, for the creation of uh, network oscillations in hippocampal microcircuits, okay? Anyway, uh, the pyramidal cells in CA1 area, they are less interconnected than those in CA3, uh, okay? And uh, all of these... Uh, Excitatory to excitatory connections I've talked about <clears throat> so far, uh, they have been observed at chemical synapses, but scientists, based on some of their uh, experiments, believe that they are uh, some excitatory to excitatory gap junctions. And they also believe that these gap junctions are probably axonic. And here you can see this zigzag line, which represents one of those gap junctions, which is axonic. It is between the axon of one pyramidal cell and the axon of another pyramidal cell. And as we all know, the speed of synaptic transmission at these gap junctions uh, is much faster than the speed of transmission at those chemical synapses. And that's why these gap excitatory to excitatory gap junctions between uh, pyramidal cells, uh, these are very important for high frequency gamma oscillations or gamma oscillatory states in hippocampal networks. Okay, now let's talk about excitatory to inhibitory connections, first again in CA3 area and then in CA1 microcircuits. Well, in the massive fiber pathway, something interesting happens. In the massive fiber pathway, 10 times more synaptic contacts are formed on interneurons in CA3 area than on those pyramidal cells in CA3 area. 10 times more synaptic contacts, I repeat, 10 times more synaptic contacts are formed on interneurons in CA3 area than on uh, pyramidal cells. And it's not just that. Even the probability of release, the probability of synaptic, uh, the probability of transmitter release is higher at these massive fiber interneuron synapses than on those massive fiber pyramidal cell synapses. 
And this generates a, a substantial feedforward inhibitory signal. And we can conclude that the net effect of the, MOSI fiber, of the activation of the MOSI fiber pathway on CA3 microcircuits is in fact inhibitory. And this complicates that simple trisynaptic pathway because I forgot to tell you that a scientist thought uh, uh, not a long time ago <coughs> that that trisynaptic pathway, that indirect trisynaptic pathway from layer two of the enteronic cortex to the dentate gyrus and the mossy fiber and Schaefer collateral pathway, they thought that that uh, trisynaptic pathway is just a very simple ex feet forward excitatory pathway. But now we can see that it's not always excitatory. Sometimes it can be inhibitory. But it's not always inhibitory either. For instance, at higher frequencies, at frequencies higher than 20 hertz, there is going to be a shift to a net, to a net excitatory drive. Uh, because some of those excitatory to excitatory connections, it means uh, those connections with uh, mossy fiber uh, in, uh, pyramidal cell connections, they may get facilitated. And some of those excitatory to inhibitory connections, mossy fiber, uh, interneuron connections, they may get uh, depressed, okay? So there's going to be a shift to a net excitatory drive at frequencies higher than 20 hertz. Okay, let's talk about excitatory to inhibitory connections in CA1 area, or marker circuits. Well, interneurons in CA1, they receive feet forward excitation from Schaefer collaterals, okay, from uh, the pyramidal cells in CA3. They also receive excitatory connections from local pyramidal cells, and then they uh, <coughs> form some feedback uh, inhibitory connections. Consider this pyramidal cell, for instance. This sends an excitatory input to this bistratified cell, and then this bistratified cell inhibits the same pyramidal cell from which it receives uh, uh, an excitatory uh, input. Okay, so here you can see this is a feedback or recurrent uh, inhibition. Okay, very beautiful. Okay, <clears throat> well, uh, Scientists who are working on the CA1 marker circuits, they believe we have two classes, two general classes of interneurons in CA1 area. Uh, they believe we have one class of interneurons that provide parasomatic inhibition, like basket cells, axonic cells, and uh, bistratified cells. They provide inhibition to parasomatic regions, to the soma and the basal dendrites, axonic, uh, axon initial segments, and sometimes proximal dendrites. And we have another class of interneurons in CA1 marker circuits, and those are uh, interneurons that provide inhibition to very distal apical dendrites, like these orient slanchronosa molecular, molecular A cells, okay? And uh, <clears throat> they believe that the source of inhibition, okay, they believe, first of all, they believe that these two classes of interneurons are two different sources of inhibition in CA1 marker circuits, and they believe that the source of recurrent inhibition actually is dynamic and it may change um, based on the state of the uh, network or the marker circuit in CA1 area. Two of those scientists who are working on CA1 marker circuits are Pauli and Esconziani. I heard the name, prof uh, the name of Professor Esconziani a lot in marker circuit papers and in papers on marker circuits and electrophysiological recordings of in, in the hippocampus. Anyway, uh, Pauli and Esconziani they did a research and they realized that in a train of action potentials, in a sequence of action potentials, the onset of the stimulus, it means those action potentials at the beginning of the stimulus, they elicited the spikes or they activated those interneurons that were perisoma targeting interneurons. Those interneurons uh, that I told you, you know, basket cells, axonic cells, and bistratified cells, those interneurons that uh, <coughs> target mostly the perisomatic region. But later, and they called these. Uh, uh, these interneurons, onsen transient interneurons. But they also realized that uh, later spikes in that train of action potential, later action potentials in that train or sequence of action potentials, they activated those uh, dendrite targeting uh, interneurons, <coughs> like Orient Slanchronosa molecular A interneurons. Okay, and they called these these this class of interneurons late persistent interneurons. Okay, so. This is another dynamic aspects of uh, hippocampal marker circuits, and I really love studying uh, dynamic aspects and dynamic features of neocortical or hippocampal marker circuits. I really enjoy uh, dynamic aspects of these marker circuits. So the source of inhibition, the source of recurrent inhibition may change uh, <clears throat> from these uh, 
perisoma targeting engine neurons to those dendrite targeting engine neurons, okay? And finally, the last type of synaptic transmission, uh, as I told you, is inhibitory to inhibitory connections. And you can see, for instance, these two basket cells, and they form inhibitory to inhibitory connections because, because both of them are inhibitory cells. And when they contact each other and they make uh, synaptic connections with each other, they make an inhibitory to inhibitory signal, and they are involved in disinhibitory uh, connections as well, okay? And we have uh, inhibitory to inhibitory chemical synapses, and we also have inhibitory to inhibitory gap junctions. Okay, yeah, I think that's it. So that was all about the three main types of synaptic transmission in CA3 and CA1 uh, micro shakers. Okay, let's get back to these uh, <clears throat> electrophysiological recordings at these synapses. These are not very, you know, uh, nothing abnormal, nothing un uh, unusual. You know, we have granule cells, which are uh, obviously uh, excitatory. So when they contact CA1, uh, CA3 pyramidal cells, they uh, cause EPSPs in those pyramidal cells. Uh, here you can see uh, <clears throat> uh, an inhibitory to inhibitory connection. When one basket cell fires, it produces IPSP uh, in another cell, in another basket cell, sorry. Here you can see inhibitory to an excitatory cell. Uh, when one basket cell fires, it produces again IPSPs or inhibitory postsynaptic potentials in, in pyramidal cells. Here an excitatory to excitatory connection, one pyramidal cell fires, it produces EPSPs or excitatory postsynaptic potentials in another pyramidal cell, and the rest is not just very interesting, so. Um, okay. Let's talk about the interneurons, and particularly interneurons in CA1 marker tickets. Uh, you know, the ratio is 80 to 20%. Uh, what I mean by that is that in the human's brain, 80% of our neurons are principal neurons, and only 20% of neurons are interneurons. But despite this fact, as Professor Gord Fischel from New York University mentioned in, mentions in one of his uh, talks at Matt Govern Institute for Brain Sciences or for Brain Research at MIT, uh, well, Professor Charles Gilbert, if you're watching this video, well, first of all, thank you for watching this video. And, uh, and you, had an, uh, you also had a lecture at Matt Govern Institute at, at MIT, and I watched that lecture and I really enjoyed that. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, Professor Gord Fischel uh, from New York University mentioned in one of his uh, talks at Matt Govern Institute, um, he mentioned a very interesting fact. He said that uh, interneurons are really important for the uh, efficient for the efficiency of information processing in any marker circuit. You know, we need balance between excitation and inhibition in any marker circuit, and interneurons, which are which are uh, you know basically inhibitory neurons, they provide that balance. They provide inhibition, and by uh, doing that. They bring balance to the information processing or to the activity of the marker circuit. Because uh, the balance between excitation and inhibition is a key to the uh, efficient information processing in any marker circuit, okay? And interneurons are one side of that balance. They provide inhibition. Um, and we have excitation by other principal neurons, okay? So, uh, yeah, <clears throat> they're very important. Uh, Professor Gord Fischel uh, is interested in uh, he's uh, interested in uh, interneurons. In particular, he's interested in the behavior of interneurons during development, how interneurons actually find their postsynaptic targets uh, during development, or how they get so diverse during development. Okay, he's a wonderful neuroscientist from New York University. Okay. Wow, sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> interneurons have a lot of modulatory functions. They can affect or control the threshold or the excitability of principal cells. They can synchronize the activity of cell, other cells, uh, particularly principal neurons. 
And they can also assist the network in selecting or choosing the pyramidal cells, or sorry, principal cells for cell assemblies, okay? And by, you know, each neurons by um, affecting the thresholds or the excitability and also by synchronizing the activity of other cells, they help uh, the formation of some oscillatory states in hippocampal marker circuits. I'm going to talk about them at the end of this lecture. Interneurons, particularly in the hippocampal marker circuits, they have a very intricate spatial temporal diversity. And what do I mean? So, uh, you know, <clears throat> by, spatial, by spatial diversity, I mean interneurons in hippocampus. They are located at, at uh, different layers of the hippocampal cortex. And by temporal diversity, I mean they fire at different times, okay? They don't, uh, they, uh, they don't fire all at the same time. And scientists have identified, I mentioned that before, 21 subtypes of interneurons in CA1 area, okay? Here they are. These are 21 subtypes of GABAergic interneurons in CA1, okay? Wow. Well, uh, I already talked about their inputs, their excitatory input. I told you that interneurons in CA1 uh, <clears throat> marker circuits, they receive feed-forward excitatory connections from Schaefer collaterals, axon collaterals of CA3 pyramidal cells. And they also receive some excitatory uh, input from uh, the local pyramidal cells in CA1 area. Another important feature of the interneurons in CA1 marker circuits is that they're, very, they're highly selective in their postsynaptic target domains. For instance, consider these axonic cells. As I mentioned before, they only provide inhibition or inhibitory input to the axon initial segment of the pyramidal cells. You can, we can consider these orient lacrinosa molecular ray cells that they only uh, provide inhibition to distal apical dendrites. And the entire uh, parasomatic region of pyramidal cells receives inhibitory inputs from three types of basket cells. Those basket cells that uh, express parvalbumin. Parvalbumin is a small calcium binding protein which is used as a molecular marker for identifying this particular type of interneuron or basket cells. Uh, <clears throat> we have those basket cells that express cholecystokinin, which is an intestinal peptide. Honestly, I don't know what is an intestinal peptide doing in the brain, but it is a still used as a, it can be used as a molecular marker. Or uh, we, have an, uh, we have those basket cells that provide that express cholecystokinin kind of positive cell positive. Uh, sorry, sorry. We have those basket cells that express cholecystokinin, kind of, or uh, <clears throat> vasoactive intestinal peptide. And we have another class of basket cells that uh, express cholecystokinin, kind of, or uh, vesicular glutamate transporter three. Okay, so we have three types of basket cells and they provide inhibition to only uh, the parasomatic region of pyramidals, uh, pyramidal cells. So these are, uh, these, were, these are three examples of that highly selective postsynaptic target domain. Okay, what else I wanted to tell you? Okay, uh, we have three main types of pyramidal cells in CA1 area as well. Uh, we have uh, those at the stratum radiatum or those closer to the stratum radiatum and those toward the stratum orients. Some of them are calvinin positive, some of them are calvinin negative. And calvinin is, is again a molecular marker to identify some of these pyramidal cells. Finally, uh, we have uh, interneurons 19 to 21 and these are interneuron specific interneurons. It means that they mainly or exclusively provide inhibition to other interneurons, okay? And they're, of course, obviously involved in uh, <clears throat> inhibitory to inhibitory connections. Uh, oh, one more important feature of interneurons in uh, CA3, CA1 shakers. And that important feature is that EPSPs, or excitatory postsynaptic potentials, are generally faster in interneurons than, uh, than in uh, pyramidal cells. And these fast EPSPs in interneurons enable <coughs> Uh, these fast EPSPs enable the precision of a spike timing, which is required for inhibition-based rhythmic changes in pyramidal cells. Interneurons are known for controlling the spike timing or the temporal kinetics of pyramidal cell or principal neurons firing. And uh, <clears throat> they make some rhythmic changes, okay, uh, in the uh, excitability or the threshold of pyramidal cells. And by doing that, uh, they 
help or they contribute to the formation of some oscillatory states with different frequencies. Again, I'm going to talk about it uh, at the end of this lecture. Okay, so yeah, these are this is tremendous diversity. We have 21 subtypes of interneurons in CA1 area. Something interesting happens uh, in cholecystic cutting positive interneurons, and I just want to introduce that briefly here. Explain that briefly here. Uh, we have, you know, here we have a cholecystic cutting positive interneuron. I told you they, there are basket cells. And then we have a postsynaptic cell. You know, when this postsynaptic cell fires an action potential, well, we have a uh, calcium ion influx, okay, into the postsynaptic cell. And these calcium ions, when they get into the postsynaptic cell, they uh, activate a calcium signaling cascade. And as a result of that calcium signaling cascade, an endocannabinoid is produced in the postsynaptic cell. And endocannabinoids are uh, small lipid molecules. They can be used as retrograde messengers in the nervous system. And here, anandamide is an example of an endocannabinoid. <clears throat> well, this endocannabinoid uh, retrograde messenger, that, that anandamide, then uh, is received by uh, cannabinoid, one, uh, cannabinoid, cannabinoid type 1 receptor, CB1, uh, at a terminal of these cholecystic ion positive interneurons. Okay? And the uh, endocannabinoid type 1 receptor, CB1, is just a, a, <clears throat> a G protein copper receptor which is coupled with an inhibitory G protein. And then when an anandamide is, act, uh, is, is, uh, is attached to this uh, CB1, it is activated, that uh, inhibitory G protein is also activated, and that inhibitory G protein inactivates or inhibits this uh, calcium ion channel. And we all know that we need calcium for the release of uh, synaptic terminal, synaptic vesicles into the synaptic cleft. But when this calcium, uh, calcium ion channel is inhibited, we don't have calcium, and when we don't have calcium, we, uh, do, we cannot have the exocytosis or the release of uh, GABAergic neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. And so, by, by using this retrograde messenger anandamide, this postsynaptic cell selectively suppress, suppresses its own GABAergic input from cholecystic and positive basket cells. So this is wonderful. You know, simply speaking, this postsynaptic cell, whenever it's active, uh, it talks to this cholecystic ion positive cell <coughs> or basket cell, and it tells that cholecystic ion positive engine run that, hey, I'm active and it stop, so stop inhibiting me. And this cholecystic ion positive cell answers, okay, I'm not going to uh, inhibit you just because you're active, but this cholecystic ion positive engine run is going to inhibit other neurons that are not active. And this selective suppression of GABAergic input is going to increase the difference or the distinction between active and inactive pyramidal cells or active-inactive uh, cell assemblies, which is really important for the dynamics of networks or the network dynamics in any market circuit, okay? It's very interesting. I just wanted to explain that. <sighs> Finally, uh, I want to talk about the interactions between pyramidal cells and interneurons and how they collaborate with each other to form some uh, network oscillations in hippocampal marker shakers. But before that, let's review some, some of those uh, common uh, <coughs> In, uh, types of interneurons in CA1. Here we have a, a pyramidal cell in CA1 microcircuits. We have cholecystic ion positive uh, basket cells. We have parvalbumin po uh, positive basket cells. We have IV cells, axaxonic cells, orions, lacrinose, and molecular cells. And you can see that each one of these uh, types of interneurons, they provide inhibition to a specific region of, these, of this pyramidal cell in CA1 microcircuits. Okay, now let's talk about oscillatory states in hippocampal networks. <coughs> I told you that interneurons cause some rhythmic changes in the threshold or excitability of uh, pyramidal cells, and by doing that, they uh, 
actually cause some oscillatory states in hippocampal networks. And those oscillatory states, they can have uh, different frequencies, for example, gamma frequency oscillatory states, theta oscillatory states. And each one of those oscillatory states, uh, they have specific functions. Here, for instance, I'm going to talk about the theta oscillatory state and how different classes of interneurons and pyramidal cells uh, collaborate with each other to form uh, that theta oscillatory state. The theta oscillatory state has a frequency between 4 hertz to 10 hertz and it's really important for the animal's movement, for the uh, rapid eye movement asleep or REM asleep, <clears throat> and also for encoding and recalling uh, of information in the hippocampal networks, okay? Well, uh, the main contributors to the theta oscillatory state are those uh, axaxonic cells. They have their maximum firing property at the peak and it's slightly after the peak of the theta oscillatory state or the theta phase. Okay, and then we have parvabulin basket cells. They have their maximum firing property at the descending phase of the theta oscillatory state. And we have uh, cholecystic cutting positive cells. <clears throat> well, they have their fi maximum firing property at the ascending phase of the theta oscillatory state. And those cells that provide inhibition to very distal apical dendrites, like orion slancronosa molecular ray cells, they have their maximum firing property at the trough of the theta oscillatory phase, where pyramidal cells also have their maximum firing property. So what this uh, tells us, uh, it actually represents the division of labor between different types of cells, uh, different types of interneurons and uh, pyramidal cells, and how they collaborate with each other to form a specific, uh, a specific oscillatory state in hippocampal networks, okay? And as I told you, those oscillatory states, they can have different, frequ different frequencies and they have different roles, okay? So, well, uh, I think that's it. Yes, of course. That's it, that was uh, all I wanted to talk about, the hippocampal marker circuits. Well, this, is the, this was the last lecture and uh, I'm going to miss uh, presenting lectures. Thank you so much for watching these, this lecture and other lectures. I hope you enjoy this lecture. And uh, after this lecture, there's going to be a conclusion video. And that's it. Thank you so much and goodbye.